Hello, everyone, and welcome to this incredibly exciting and timely event. And a key component of this year's USC Institute on Inequalities and Global Health virtual lecture series, which has as its focus, unfortunately, the many and varied fallouts of the Dobbs decision. My name is Sophia Gruskin, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to Abortion Services and Access in a post world World. What does this mean for Los Angeles and for the United States? This event is done in partnership with the USC Law and Global Health Collaboration, the wonderful steering committee of folks from across the university who've been concerned about the impacts of the Dobbs decision, and the Kaysom Center for Gender Equity in Medicine and Science. And so on our collective behalf, welcome. Um, by way of introduction, and before introducing Dr. Cahoon, who's the moderator for this, can I say, star panel, let me start by, by saying that I don't think it's an exaggeration that the varied impacts of the Dobbs decision have been weighing heavily on all of our minds. And our hope through this series is to try to open space, not only for trying to understand this crazy landscape that we're living in, but also the various vantage points that can be addressed as we go forward into the midterms and beyond. And my not so subtle message here, please vote, please vote. <laughs> Um, so those of us who were with us last month will remember that our, our first session was with the amazing Loretta Ross, and, and she framed the broader set of issues we need to consider in terms of service delivery, policy, and activism going forward. You can find it on YouTube, and I highly encourage you to do so if you haven't seen it. Um, this is the second in the series, and we've got this incredible lineup that's going to help us to understand what Dobbs means for the provisions of services in LA and across the US, including states with laws that outright ban or severely restrict access, such as Indiana uh, and Texas. And to give you just a sense of some of the other events coming up, the next one will be about the global impact of dogs in terms of health equity and diplomacy uh, globally. And then we're gonna have one followed by a specific focus on the legal and policy landscape specifically and on advocacy and all that before the midterms. Oh wait, did I say vote? Vote please, so before the midterms. So in short for this event, Dr. Cahoon will moderate a discussion amongst all panelists. There'll be an opportunity for some Q&A from the audience, so please do use the Q&A function. And then we'll be closed out by my wonderful colleague and co-conspirator in this work, Dr. Parveen Parmar. And with that, it is my great pleasure to turn it over to Dr. Sigita Cahoon, Assistant Professor and Co-Director of Labor and Delivery, Obstetrics and Gynecology at Keck School of Medicine here at USC, and a real leader in this area and wonderful person. It's a pleasure to have her moderate this panel. Sigita, please take it away. Thank you so much, Sophia. Um, but so as Sophia said, I'm Sigita Cahoon. I'm an OBGYN and assistant professor at USC, as well as co-director of labor and delivery at Los Angeles County USC Medical Center. Um, and so I'll start again by stating the obvious that the overturn of Roe v. Wade is just such a seismic shift in the provision of reproductive health care as we know it. I remember kind of when I was preparing for this, graduating from medical school and wondering if the big things in medicine had already happened. And now here we are coming out of COVID and now facing a threat to women's reproductive health care that until very recently, I didn't think I would see in my lifetime. Those of us that are here today from USC feel very lucky to be in California, but the confusion and the misinformation and panic, honestly, in the light of the Dobbs decision has far reaching impacts even here. Um, affecting safe pr provision of reproductive health care in wide ranging ways. We've seen patients present with suicide attempts who due to you know, information that they've heard in the media believe that they can't get an abortion even in California. I have colleagues working in states with severely restricted abortion access who are now facing challenges, even treating common infections with antibiotics during pregnancy or treating patients uh, for their pain after surgery during pregnancy due to fear that medications might harm the fetus even when they're long studied and well utilized. And then in places across the country, evidence-based healthcare is being withheld from pregnant women experiencing incomplete abortions, premature rupture of membranes and ectopic pregnancies until their lives are seriously in danger. And we are going to get more into the extreme financial and social hardship of creating these big geographic disparities in access to quality care. 
So at USC, we've been focusing on providing comprehensive reproduction, reproductive education to all of our medical students. In our ob residency program, we've been focusing on training all residents to be competent and comfortable in providing abortion services and recognizing pregnancy complications, which will require medical or surgical management and providing adequate contraception. And then we provide advanced fellowship training in surgical abortion for management of terminations at later gestations and uh, contraception for me our medically complicated patients. And then as an institution, we've been preparing for a potential influx of patients to our state for patients seeking abortion services. But we know we really need to double down on advocacy and spreading evidence-based health education that directly addresses misinformation, models compassionate and comprehensive reproductive health care, and destigmatizes abortion, those seeking it, and those providing it. So from that perspective, I'm very excited to introduce our panel of speakers. Um, so I'll start with Dr. Susie Baldwin. Uh, Dr. Susie Baldwin works as medical director of the Office of Women's Health at Los Angeles uh, County Department of Public Health, where her work focuses on issues impacting women's health equity, including sexual and reproductive health, gender-based violence, as well as human trafficking and women's health epidemiology. She's also served on the board of multiple organizations, including as medical director of Planned Parenthood of Southern Arizona, on the board of Physicians for Reproductive Health, and on the Planned Parenthood Federation of America National Medical Committee, and she has been a provider at Southern California Planned Parenthood Affiliates. We also have Dr. Tracy Wilkinson. She is currently an assistant professor of pediatrics at the Indiana University School of Medicine. She's conducted key research on availability and access to over-the-counter emergency contraception for adolescents, which contributed to the removal of age restrictions for emergency contraception nationally. And she previously spent time as faculty at CHLA before returning to a research-focused career at University of Indiana, where her work focuses on improving young people's access to reproductive health services. And as part of her advocacy, she recently wrote an op-ed in the New York Times defending her colleague for treating a 10-year-old rape victim. We also have Francine Coiteau, who's a public health specialist and the co-founder and co-director of Plan C Pills. She has decades of experience in developing reproductive health programs and new reproductive technologies, including the development of emergency contraception, medical abortion, and microbicides. And among other projects, she helped found the Reproductive Health Technologies Project, contributed to the creation of Planned Parenthood's first adolescent outreach programs in San Francisco, as well as co-founded the Pro-Choice Alliance for Responsible Research. And finally, we have Dr. Linda Prine, a professor of family and community medicine at the Icon School of Medicine in, at Mount Sinai in New York City. Among her numerous projects, she's co-founder of the Reproductive Health Access Project, and she works as a medication abortion provider in Southern New Mexico and works for Aid for Access, or works for Aid Access, helping to get abortion pills to people in Texas. And she does all of this while championing the integration of abortion and miscarriage and contraception care into family medicine teaching and services. And her work was recently featured in a New York Times Magazine article. So I wanted to welcome everybody. And I wanted to start by noting the diversity of the disciplines that we have represented here and that are involved in the provision and advocacy for safe abortion. So can I start with each of you orienting us to the kind of work that you're doing now in abortion services and also where in the country are you actively working and what sorts of advocacy efforts are you currently engaged in? And I can start. Oh, sorry, I muted myself. I can start with Susie if that's okay. Sure, thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us today for this important conversation. So uh, my background, as you heard, is in sexual reproductive health. And in my current position at LA County Department of Public Health, we are very focused on addressing the need for access to reproductive health services in general and abortion in particular among both our own residents in the county who may face challenges accessing care, as well as to be a place where people can come from other parts of California where they don't have good access to care and people from out of state who no longer can access the very essential services that they need. LA County is involved in something called the Abortion Safe Haven Pilot Project, which we're happy to say has been funded by the state as part of the campaign to make California a reproductive freedom state. 
Um, so I bring that perspective. I'm a preventive medicine specialist with a lot of training in office-based gynecology and family planning. So I bring my patients with me into the work I do to advance advocacy and access for all. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Cool. Tracy? Hi, everybody. Um, I'm coming uh, from Indiana. So um, I miss the warm weather of California right now because it just turned fall. Um, as uh, Dr. Cahoon mentioned, I'm actually a pediatrician, um, but I do a lot of advocacy work talking about how important it is for reproductive health care to be accessible by everybody. Um, I would say pretty confidently that Indiana is one of the battleground states or capitals of anti-abortion extremism. Um, and so we tend to be one of the first states to pass some of the most extreme legislation. And we are already starting to see attacks on other you know, topics of bodily autonomy um, as the fight over trans care is right around the corner for us here. Um, and so I really, um, I'm excited to share some of the uh, the work that we're doing and also the perspective from another state um, that's really different than California politically, but I think um, is a really good preview of what we should expect more nationally um, with the upcoming elections. Francine? Thank you, Dr. Cahoon. Um, my name is Francine Coiteau. I'm uh, coming to you from California, Los Angeles. Um, the Plan C um, initiative campaign that we started in 2014 is specifically to bring to the US the experience and the knowledge that we knew existed in the rest of the world, in most of the rest of the world, that there were medication abortion pills that were safe and effective and could be very, very helpful in addressing our need in this country to have an additional opportunity to, um, to take matters in our own hands for those of us who had an unwanted pregnancy. Um, so when we started Plan C, it was really uh, based on uh, two, part, two things. You, you mentioned the different sectors that are involved. Um, I'm probably the only one here that is not a clinician. I'm a public health advocate a expert in, in uh, the introduction of new technologies. And I had worked a lot on uh, getting medication, uh, emergency contraception over the counter, or actually from an idea that you could use pills to um, give yourself a second chance if you had an un unprotected sex and getting it all the way to over the counter. That was two decades of work by all sorts of people in many, many sectors, including legal, um, regulatory, advocacy, me, um, medical, you name it. We had to work across all the sectors and bring everyone along to get to the point where we had emergency contraception over the counter. So we've been trying to work on that for medication abortion, for mifepristone and mesoprostol, and really um, have come a, a huge way, a long way. I, I, I could spend a lot of time over the history, but really, frankly, very quickly, actually begin with the COVID coming through where everybody had to step up and realize, well, oh my goodness, maybe we need to take more advantage of this um, other way of helping someone who needs an early, um, early meaning first trimester abortion, which is to get pills into their hands and help that, let them use them. So we've been really focused on this whole idea of really taking the, the putting self manage allowing people to really take the agency into their own hands of having the pills, knowing what to do, um, and making all the decisions as to whether or not they take them, where they take them, when they take them, and know that they're safe and effective. So. Um, I'm going to leave it there because um, I'm going to I'm going to ask Linda Prime to talk, be the one, next one to talk because she's going to be able to talk very specifically about um, the the clinicians who have um, really taken the lead in in making this real in this country. That today we are in a position with these horrible laws that are now in effect. We're in a position in which we can say. It doesn't matter what your zip code is. It doesn't matter where you live. 
you can get abortion pills shipped to you, mailed to you to your home. And there are people, clinicians, and Linda is one of them, who can help you answer questions if you choose or if you have questions and you need help from somebody. So I'm gonna pass it to you, Linda. Thanks, Francine. Um, I think I'm supposed to answer the question though, which was about how has my practice changed since the fall of Roe and what kind of advocacy am I involved in? Is that, is that right? <laughs> Um, just sort of setting the stage in terms of where you work and what kind of work, although that's the next question, so you can okay, so where segue working, into it. Okay, I'll wait on the advocacy. Um, so I work in New York City and also in New, southern New Mexico. In New York City, I um, work both in a family practice setting and at Planned Parenthood of Greater New York. And we anticipated a big flood of patients when Roe fell and you know, as probably all of the blue states did. And it hasn't really come to pass particularly. We'll, we'll have a couple of patients a day, you know, from, a, from another state, but it's no flood. And I'm not that surprised by it because from my experience in talking to Texas patients from New Mexico, people can't afford to just pack up and go travel somewhere else to get their abortions. So, you know, the I mean, people with a lot of money can, and they do, and they probably go to private practices, but they are not necessarily coming to New York City to Planned Parenthood. Um, in New Mexico, our practice changed a lot. I work in a little family medicine practice there, and I'm a telemedicine provider for that practice, both for the practice as well as for aid access. And so we provide um, pills and we can do it by mail to anyone in New Mexico. But for Texas patients, starting with SB8, when that happened, we got flooded with requests for people from Texas who could no longer get abortions past six weeks at that time. They had to travel to us. And we would often recommend that they try calling aid access instead of traveling to us because then they don't have to travel. And many people took that on, but it makes them nervous because it's a two to three week wait if you're in a restricted state because you're actually ordering your pills from Rebecca Gompartz, who is in Europe, and then the pills come from India. So it takes two or three weeks to get to people, and that's really nerve wracking for folks. Um, otherwise, they would have to travel to us in Texas. Now, some workarounds have started happening where people are finding out about mail forwarding and they're buying addresses in New Mexico and giving us those addresses and telling us that that's where they are. And we don't have any way of knowing that that's not where they are. So some people are, you know, who are pretty tech savvy are managing to do that, but there's still a lot of healthcare disparities going on in terms of who has access to abortion care in states like Texas. And since Roe fell, it's not just Texas anymore and it's everybody in Texas. You can't get an abortion under six weeks anymore in Texas. You can't get one at all in Texas. And two weeks ago, Arizona fell. So now we have people coming from Arizona and Texas to New Mexico. And um, it's, you know, listening to the patients, I answer the phone a lot just because I like to talk to people who are trying to get their appointments. And we really have a very streamlined way of doing it through, um, you know, through our website and through text messaging and so on. But I want to hear what's going on with folks. And so I do have a lot of conversations with patients about what they're trying to do and where they're coming from and what they need. And so many people have children, they have children and they can't just up and leave them for a day or two to come to New Mexico. They, and there, there's this pressure on providers from lawyers to tell people that when they come to New Mexico, they should stay and use all of their pills in New Mexico before they go back to Texas or Arizona, which is so unrealistic. I mean, you know, they've driven eight, 10, 16 hours, and then they're supposed to stay over and who's going to take care of their kids and how, where are they going to stay? And people do get some funding, but there's, 
it's overwhelming how many people need help. And when they, when they talk to us, they're like, well, I called 20 times and I could not get anyone to answer the phone. It's just not so easy to get funding. And there are, it's pretty chaotic out there. There are a lot of different organizations offering funding. People call every organization, they call every clinic. They can't remember which clinic they spoke to. They're, you know, I, they call us and they're like, um, I have an appointment today. And I'm like, well, we're not even open today. So that appointment wasn't really with us. And trying to help everybody navigate the complexity of this post row world is really a mess. Um, anyway, there's, a, there's loads of stories I could tell you, but I will let us circle back to the advocacy piece. I should just say that there's one other area of work that I do, which is the miscarriage and abortion hotline, which is a hotline that's available for people to call for free. They can get medical advice if they are in the midst of a miscarriage or using the abortion pills. Um, and we, we take call for 18 hours out of 24. We're available online. It's all all clinicians, there are 50 of us who rotate the calls. And our volume has gone through the roof since Roe fell, as you can imagine. Um, so I, I understand Francine's idea of how liberating it is for people to just get pills and use them on their own. And that's great. But I'm seeing the side of it where people are actually kind of nervous, and they want some advice and some handholding and to make sure that they're doing it right. And then our other big role is keeping people out of the hospital because people call and they're scared and they think like, is this really okay what I'm going through? Am I possibly having too much bleeding? Um, and, and they are fine. They, this self-managed abortion is safe. And 90% of what we do is talk them through that they are actually okay. You know, we ask them carefully how many pads are you bleeding through and you know are you lightheaded or dizzy and on and on and everybody is fine so um that's our role is reassurance and helping people just get through it and get their lives back on track which is what the abortion pills let them do thanks that was perfect, Linda. That was the, the segue into kind of the next part of the question, which you already started describing, which is, you know, describing the changes that you've seen in your own work since the overturn of Roe. Are these changes that are just happening in your state or more broadly? And what does this mean for the communities you serve? And what further changes are you anticipating? And I think that description is so great. Our healthcare system is already so complex. And now we're looking at such rapid changes over you know state lines and can you go here can you go there and and so i really liked that your description of what you're seeing um, i'm happy to chime in i would say that there's just been an overall chilling effect happening um, amongst lots of medical personnel from pharmacists to dermatologists to oncologists cardiologists all of them are suddenly realizing that a lot of the language of these legislation could apply to their practice and they're really scared. Um, right after our abortion ban went into effect, we suddenly had um, panic phone calls coming from pharmacists that were terrified that they were filling medications that could be interpreted as abortifacients. Um, something that was never intended from the legislation, but the way the language was written, it wasn't very clear. And so, um, the kind of constant, um, you know, landmines that we're walking into when you try to legislate medicine are, are very evident. Um, and when the consequences are potentially losing your job, losing your license, or being put into jail, or being like, you know, on Fox News being targeted, I think that that is very, um, very scary for anybody that is trying to help a patient. Um, and so that's one of the impacts that that I've seen. And then to to to, to piggyback on something that Linda said earlier, um, we did a study in Indiana before the Dobbs decision to ask um, a lot of people that were getting abortions, like what their experiences were. And we found that 88% of people were reporting that they had to choose between um, paying utilities, rent, or for food to pay for their abortion, 88%. And despite the fact that Indiana borders Illinois, which for us is like an amazing blue kind of haven for abortion access, 
a vast majority of the people that we take care of in our, you know, academic centers and in our um, in our federally qualified health centers, if I were to tell them, you know, I need you to get to Chicago tomorrow with six hundred dollars in cash, they would look at me like I just told them to get to the moon. That is literally so hard for them to operationalize and actually get done, especially with like children, jobs, et cetera, that they have on their, um, their like plate that they have to sustain in order to make sure that they don't default on a payment for something else that would, you know, stumble their family out of control. Um, and so that's the landscape that we're already starting to see in Indiana and was present before the Dobbs decision. And we anticipate it's just going to get so much worse. May I add to what Tracy just said about the, um, the, the fear and the effect of what that's doing, not just to providers, which you, you, we've all seen for years, right? I mean, literally being shot for being an abortion providers. I mean, that's been the fear of, uh, for many uh, states. <laughs> But now, uh, I don't know if you all saw this article today, uh, and I think it was The Guardian about um, Idaho, um, the University of Idaho. I mean, here we are at University of Southern California. The University of Idaho was, has just been told that any employee, not medical, just any employee, um, including professors, teachers, TAs, you name it, janitors, anybody because they're paid for by the state cannot talk about abortion, cannot talk about family plan, about contraception, can no longer, I mean, it's, it's, it's truly shocking. And this is really, really important for us to hear because the point of this whole approach for the last 30 years of, of really decimating abortion services and abortion access by, by threatening and, 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 and scaring providers is now moved into the realm of anybody who shares information because people now recognize that it can be just information for helping you know how to take care of yourself. Um, and um, while, Everything Linda said about the obstacles still to taking care of yourself are still there. The fact that we no longer even have partners who are willing to share the information to help somebody empower themselves is really, really, I don't, I don't have a word for it. It's really scary, egregious. Um, it, it's gotten to the point where I really think we need to be thinking about civil disobedience, <laughs> there's, there's no other way to say it because how can we obey these laws that are really taking away our, our, our human rights, our, first, our, our, um, our right to free speech, our right to health, our right to health care. Those are the rights that are now being taken away by these laws. And so continuing to fight by trying to figure out how we can li limit our liabilities and live within these laws is getting to the point where it's not quite clear that there is any other way out besides having to stand up and say, you know what, this is not okay. So I, I'm not quite ready to do the civil disobedience thing. <laughs> I'm just trying to stay out of jail for a while longer, but I would like to see us mobilize in our um, pro-choice states to get some legislation passed that would shield providers so that we could provide at least telemedicine abortions across state lines because it isn't realistic to expect people to travel and they could get these pills um, much faster than ordering them from India if we could do it from our blue states. So we've been working on that solution and it has actually gotten passed in Massachusetts, um, like at the very end of July, and we're working with providers there to get them up and ready to go with um, being able to mail pills into the blue states. It's a lot of hoops to jump through. You have to create a little corporation and you have to get your own malpractice and um, you have to sign a lot of paperwork with the company that you order the pills from because the REMS is still in effect. And in terms of advocacy, that's something that we need to really fight against as well. 
but being that the REMS is in effect and that um, only one state has passed a shield law to protect telemedicine providers, the two fronts that we have to work on are trying to get shield law, a shield law passed in other states and trying to get the FDA to stand up and say like, this is a legal medicine in the US. This, this medication and then get rid of the rest of the REMS, let it be, but let it be prescribed into the pharmacies everywhere in every state. It's makes, it is not a dangerous drug. It shouldn't be classified as a dangerous drug. It should be available in every pharmacy, just like um, birth control, or, or maybe it should be over the counter. Like there's a move for that as well. But step one would be just to be able to prescribe it at a regular pharmacy in every state in the country. So there's lots of advocacy avenues and we're hopeful that some of our blue states will do this telemedicine across state lines so that we can begin to, to ship pills to Texas, Mississippi, Alabama, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Again, more people need to even know about the option of pills. We've got tons of education to do. Something like 50% of Americans have never even heard of an abortion pill. So we've, you know, there's lots of room for outreach, advocacy, education, et cetera, in addition to trying to change our laws. And if I could just add to that, um, given that California, um, our governor did just sign a package of 12 bills that were put forward by the California Future of Abortion Council, including a law that protects both patients and providers um, as much as possible from legal liability for, for providing care that may be illegal um, for in the patient's home state. So our state is taking many steps to make this a safe environment for people to receive abortion and other reproductive health services. I'm not familiar with the details enough to know what the limitations would be on telemedicine across state lines, but the goal was to protect the patients who are receiving care from our providers here and to protect, those, protect the providers from liability charges and whatever other states may throw at us, criminal charges even. So. Um, we are those of us who are here in Los Angeles and in California feel very privileged to be here, and we also have a duty to push the boundaries as far as we can go to show the rest of the country where they are prohibiting access to very basic essential health care that this is safe, this is needed, and we're going to make sure we give it to as many people as possible who can't get it at home. And fortunately, through the work of, of Linda and Francine, we're able to to build on that, um, but we do have our work cut out for us to meet the needs of all of these people who simply do not have the resources to get what they need from us at this point or the knowledge. Great, I wanted to follow up on that. You know, we've already kind of talked about some strategies in terms of medication, abortion, access and shield laws. Um, and you guys have in multiple ways mentioned these wide geographic disparities that people don't have the resources to just cross state lines and it's difficult to, to even kind of amass those resources. Um, and we know this is affecting communities of color, communities affected by poverty most at, who are most at risk. And so whose voices do we need to, to amplify here? And also um, how concerned do we need to be about like data tracking in terms of our phones or other methods of communication while we're trying to create these support networks? I could start out on that. Um, first by noting that we happen to be a very white panel. And usually when I'm in conversations about advancing reproductive health and rights, the people at the table are women of color who are leading reproductive justice movements here in LA, in our state and around the country. And we need women of color at our tables. We need them at the head of the table. They're doing a lot of amazing work on the ground and in the state houses to advance reproductive health and rights. Um, and communities of color and immigrant communities are also the ones most targeted by the surveillance state and by the police state. And I mean, even now there are ads running about Apple Watch tracking your cycles and all kinds of apps to track your period. And meanwhile, we have legislators who are proposing a database of people's menstrual cycles. So it is absolutely terrifying and insane, but this is our world. So I think we have to always keep in mind that these, these 
criminalizations of pregnancy and reproduction impact all of us in ways that are frightening and horrible, but they impact most often and first our colleagues of color and our communities of color. Um, I also think that as a strategy moving forward, looking at the criminalization of pregnancy, the criminalization of abortion as part of the larger movement against decriminalization. So we wanna decriminalize abortion, we wanna decriminalize miscarriage management, we wanna decriminalize pregnancy and people who wind up arrested um, for using drugs when they are pregnant, when we know that um, addiction is a disease. Women should not wind up in jail, pregnant people should not wind up in jail for that. So I think aligning our movement with the broader movements for decriminalization is a really important strategy that's being discussed as well. Um, but as far as the surveillance state, we have to exercise a lot of caution and hopefully one of you guys can follow up on that. I'm wondering if Francine, you have any comment because there seems to be such a fine line between educating yourself to take care of yourself and your body and kind of empowering yourself and then potentially putting a person putting themselves in danger in, given the criminalization that we're looking at. Absolutely, it is a fine line and it's possibly our biggest challenge is how to get information into the most uh, um, the communities most at risk of, of criminalization that Susie has just mentioned. We know that they are the ones who are at mo uh, most vulnerable really. Um, and so, and given that this model is, it, it, it involves uh, tech, technology. I mean, it is, it requires being able to text then, and, you know, the mail. Um, it, it, and so how do we make sure that we're not putting anybody at risk by asking them to use these technologies of paying with a credit card, of, of being able to, you know, have a phone and, um, how do we make sure that everything on our end is as tight as possible so that it won't be us um, putting them at risk? Um, at this, and and the, the very, very difficult fine line is, is that the, uh, the idea of, of pulling back and not sharing information because we worry about putting them at, at risk doesn't sit well, right? Because they need, they need the information. And that is in fact, part of the strategy of the right is to make it so difficult for us to communicate to either help each other as or organizations or help um, the, the people who are interested in getting the services by scaring uh, us into thinking that if we do communicate, we're gonna put each other at risk. And so having to make a big deal about pointing out who's, who's the aggressor here. The aggressor is the legislature, the, the legislators, the, the, the people who are putting these laws on the books. That's who we need to be fighting. Um, it's it, the advocacy that, that is required around that is, is critical. And, um, and then last thing I'll add to all of that, absolutely to what Susie said, we, we work very, very hard to make sure that it's the communities themselves and people in the communities that are coming up with the message and who are the messengers, not us, um, a national organization, white led and, and gray haired. It's, it's very much more working with the communities on the ground to have them determine what they think they want to hear, how they want to hear it, what way to, to get that information and put and make sure that um, and then the final thing is make sure that there are resources for them should they in criminalized. So that's another piece that we worked very hard at was making sure that there are the resources of if, when, how, and National Advocates for Pregnant Women and all the legal scholars who are there to immediately uh, should anyone get um, criminalized. I wanted to circle back to activism efforts um, and look, looking at what's happened with Roe, looking at these kind of progressive or successive state by state restrictions. Um, are there changes in strategy or changes in messaging that you think abortion advocates should be taking at this point? I'll just jump in and say that from what happened in Kansas, 
message really is one, a bigger one. It's not about abortion. It's about, um, you know, autonomy. It's about uh, human rights. It's about health care. It's about, um, you know, get, get, get the politicians out of our homes and, and away from, you know, we have a right to all these rights. That is where we have to be focused. It's no, uh, you know, the more we just dig in with a right access abortion services, the less we make inroads. Yeah, I mean, I will echo what Francine just said. I think that that has been our mistake, to be honest, for decades. We have been focused on one piece of this puzzle and it has resulted in kind of like a whack-a-mole feeling, right? Like we do this, they do that. Um, you know, Linda talking about the, the protection for telemedicine, immediately my, my brain went to, oh, my state legislature will then just pass a law to criminalize the patients. It, it'll protect the physicians or the clinicians in that state, but like it won't actually help us because our legislator, this is about control. This is about control and it is about taking decisions that belong in patients' hands out of their hands and giving it to the state legislature. And the more we message and stay on that broader message, I think the more it resonates. It also brings many more people into this conversation that need to be a part of this conversation and that have not been a part of this conversation in the past, um, which again is where I think we've been too siloed for too long. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's my two cents. I think one of the other things we need to think about, though, when it comes to these um, laws, like particularly, I, it's maybe a lesson from Texas, is that much of this is just fear mongering. Not one, one person only got arrested in Texas, intentionally arrested, for um, aiding and abetting an abortion after that law was passed. Nine months went by before Roe fell, and no, not one other person was arrested, the optics of arresting people for this stuff is really not gonna play well with the public. And so the purpose of these laws is to just scare us and it is working, it's really working. People are doing all kinds of crazy things to avoid um, what might get in even a stretch of the imagination be considered to be breaking a law. You know, like the thing about telling people to stay for two days in a blue state to take their abortion pills before they travel back home. Like there are, you know, we're, we're bending over backwards out of fear and there's not any evidence that we need to be afraid of these things. Um, so I'm not sure what we do with that information except try harder to get care to people who need it. And, um, you know, people, uh, let people make their own decisions about what they want to walk into. As we talk to folks, like, you know, see where what their risk level is and what they want to do in order to get the care they need and not, you know, not designate, like, you have to do it this way or you should do it that way. Be I mean, people are asking me the craziest questions. One woman wanted to know if um, airport security was going to check her bags for pills before she went back to Texas. That kind of fear is just ruining people's lives. It's so scary for them. And, and it's, not, I, it's not coming to pass. So it's something we need to think about when we're um, out there trying to lead people to to make change is that the, the, the right has made a lot of laws to scare us half to death and they're not really doing anything except for keeping us from practicing good medicine. And then how do we address the fact that we keep hearing about physicians who are changing their practice because of the fear? Yeah. It's one thing for patients on their own to be terrified, but is there a way, I mean, I, this is actually more of a question for the rest of you, how do we stop physicians from not properly treating pregnant people because of their fear? That's just outrageous. Yeah. If there's anything to stand up for, it's your patient's life. Yeah, I think it's tricky. And this kind of um, piggybacks on the Idaho story that Francine brought up earlier. Um, I have been really disappointed, but not surprised by the council in our medical institutions being incredibly conservative and very risk averse. 
Um, and I, it, you know, a lot of us have been frustrated by their responses as we figured out how to implement our abortion ban um, in Indiana. And we realized that, you know, for decades, these conversations have been quarantined outside of the mainstream medical institutions. All of the trap laws, which are the targeted restrictions on abortion providers that have been passed year after year after year, have applied to clinical settings that are outside of mainstream large organizations and educational institutions. And so the lawyers have very, very little experience on, you know, um, how to interpret these, what types of risks they could take on as an institution, and how to counsel um, their employees on what they can and cannot do. And so they tend to be really conservative, which is why I think what is happening at University of Idaho has happened. The, you know, the, the guidance came out and it and it is it, it's crazy to all of us reading it, but that's what the lawyers are interpreting and that's what they have to recommend. Um, and so I think that it's hard to, um, you know, we had lawyers um, basically telling us that their that our malpractice and our legal representation might not stand if we do not follow um, that like recommendation. And so to ask even me as a clinician to take on the legal risk personally to breaking some of these recommendations is a really big ask. It's a really, really big ask. And I and I think that that's why the fear is um, palpable and why the fear is real, um, because people uh, don't want to cross that line. And it's understandable. Um, we have much more privilege than even our patients do. And so if we're afraid, it's not surprising that they are terrified. Um, and, you know, to the point, there are, there, there are women that are being prosecuted for being pregnant, for using um, substances while they're pregnant, for miscarriage management issues that are minoritized individuals that do not hit the news stream and do not get the attention that a lot of us probably need to be giving them. And that has been happening for years on the ground before Dobbs occurred. Um, and so I do think that we have to be cognizant of the fact that like asking people to take these risks is, um, is a really big decision. Yeah, and, and probably we as privileged white women should be stepping up and being the ones to take risks as clinicians or as spokespeople like, like you're saying, well, here's a panel of a bunch of white ladies again, but you're going to ask black doctors to stop what they're doing and come be on a panel for free on their own time. You know, maybe that's not the right thing to do either. And so we got to do what we can do, which is speak up and be out front and and take risks um, because we're less likely to get in trouble for it. And so I'm all for like leading that charge of trying to push the envelope um, as somebody who's close to retirement. I can do that. And that's, I think, what I can do. Um, and we each have to figure out what we can do. And, you know, it's, I, I really feel for you in a state like Indiana, where you have to be so afraid. It's, it's really, it's so tough. And repeating what I think both you, Tracy, and you, Linda, said, uh, when we do push, we often find that nothing happens. <laughs> um, so the aid access providers, and Linda included, were, were shipping pills um, in states that were they're in what we call the blue states where it was legal, but we're being told, you can't do that. That's illegal. According to the REMS, you have to have X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z. And, and they did it. And then the law showed that, in fact, it was okay. But they... And then the same thing happened to us when SB8 happened. We were told by our lawyers, who we do not pay any lawyer, but they give us all sorts of advice and we decide we listen or we don't. Uh, but one of them was take down your, your website for Texas. Uh, you know, you're, you're risking the entire Plan C by having this website with a drop down menu for Texas. And our, our response was, the opposite. Texas is who needs us most now. We're going to go out there with a 
uh, you know, with a big billboard and we're going to say, yeah, get us for aiding and abetting. It's our, our right. And as Linda is saying, we were, you know, privileged. We were from outside of Texas. We, you know, we were just not even a medical provider. We we're just sharing information, our First Amendment right to do so. And guess what? They didn't, they Nothing happened to us. Actually, a lot happened to us. We had so many people give $25 donations to Plan C in honor of Governor Abbott. We saw an amazing reaction of anger on the part of people in Texas when they saw that we were willing to stand up and, and once again, standing up. And as Linda said, nobody did anything about that SB8. So I do wonder if we couldn't be in the privileged states that we are, um, literally starting to say, I'm sorry, but this not shipping medicines across state lines is just doesn't make sense. I'm going to start doing it. And what if hundreds of doctors from New York, California, and a whole bunch of other states where they could do it, um, started doing it, what really would happen? And who would be, who's, I know the liability is scary, is, you know, wait, that with the need that we keep hearing and the liability of not getting served is something to weigh, an opportunity, a, a question to ask. So I think from all of your points, we can see there's just, this is a time of a lot of confusion, a lot of roadblocks. It's a very messy time in this field. And so I wondered if each of you could comment a little bit on do you see any hidden opportunities here? Is what's giving you hope or what's inspiring you to keep moving forward? Well, it's easy for me to be hopeful uh, being based here in Los Angeles and again, being privileged to be working on the creation of a safe haven abortion pilot. Um, this is work that many of us have wanted to do forever. And we were only given the opportunity because things have gotten so dire throughout the nation. So I do, you know, I, this is setting us back decades. I fear for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people being harmed before we see a remedy to this. So it's hard for me to say that I'm hopeful. Um, pendulums, pendula, do swing. Um, you know, there's going to be devastation in between, but at least here we are able to really imagine what equitable access to sexual reproductive health care looks like and try to build that system. And it's very complicated. There's many different players. The funding seems like a lot, but is it really enough to last all the years we need it for? Probably not. Um, are we even going to be able to serve the people that we most aim to serve because they can't even get to Los Angeles? But I do see reason to find a silver lining in what's happening in that if we can create a system that really does work, then we'll have a model as we rebuild reproductive health access in this nation overall. I'm hopeful about the telemedicine being a way to improve medical care in general and, and expand access in general. I think that it's interesting that we're leading the way with abortion as, as the first place where we're really trying to make it happen across state lines, but it should be everywhere. Like, you know, people go and they travel to someplace like the Mayo Clinic and they get cancer care there, and then they need to follow up with that person, but they've gone to another state and they can't get the follow-up because they're in a different state. Like we, we can make improvements and lead the way to making medical care better by showing that these state boundaries are irrelevant and let's move into a new world here. If I could have one more helpful thing I did mention was the, the enactment of provisions to cover enabling services, the, the things that prevent people from getting to care in the first place, like transportation, like childcare. If, uh, if we can build a system that really does allow people to get what they need. What, you know, if they, there's also the problem of people not having a smartphone or a computer. So if we look at all of these issues where we can to elevate 
the neediest among us to be able to access care, then, you know, if Medi-Cal is able to cover these services, I think moving forward, getting people served by a more comprehensive, holistic system of health is potentially in our future. I am, I am very hopeful. Um, my husband tells people that the best thing that ever happened to Plan C was COVID, and then it was, uh, you know, these horrible laws. And it's, there's a, it's kind of a joke, but it's not a joke. I mean, the truth is, is that it's been way too many decades that we, that the women of color and the reproductive justice folks have been telling us, we don't have a right to abortion in this country. Um, you know, it's been being, you know, some have a right, the others of us don't. And it's, and it's now, now it's a, sort of like maybe we needed to go even deeper before we can spring back and recognize the issues of inequity in our country and and the issues of all the very basic horrible issues of racism, sexism, you, you listen, all the isms are real. And now people are beginning to have to realize that and hopefully back to Sophia's go vote. Um, yes. We are our, our, our democracies on the line, our autonomy on the line, a lot is on the line. And I think the we as the abortion folks are are the ones who have the most opportunities to show made that the hope that that there is that we don't have to be back in the in the days of coat hangers. It's a completely different place, thanks to all the work that all all the providers have been doing for so many years now. Yeah, and I'll just say that um, I'm hopeful given what happened on the ground in Indiana um, during our abortion ban legislation. Um, we saw alliances and groups coming together that have never been on the same page when it comes to reproductive um, rights and realizing that this is really bigger than that um, gave me hope that, you know, even in a state like Indiana, which I always tell people, we are not a red state, we are a gerrymandered purple state um, that has been very successfully controlled by Republicans, but that does not mean that there are not progressives here. Um, but we found the most conservative medical organizations standing with us against this abortion ban. And that was really like hopeful. And it gave me hope that there is messaging and there is a movement here that we have to to take and use. Um, my heart breaks for the number of years it's gonna take before we're able to reverse this and that women, people are able to access healthcare in their communities and not have to travel to California um, to get it. Um, so that's what gives me hope one day. I just wanted to thank all of you guys for such an engaging conversation and all of your unique perspectives and sharing your expertise. And we're almost at the end of the hour. So I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Parveen Parmar. Yeah, just to echo exactly what um, Dr. Cahoon said, thank you so much for uh, this panel, for giving us your time. Audience, thank you for engaging. Um, we have um, a couple of events coming up. I don't know if um, Michelle, you can bring up the slide. Um, you know, it's clear that this is a, this is something we are all going to uh, have to figure out how we can act on and how we can advocate for our patients, because at the end of the day, it is our patients that are going to suffer. Um, just to highlight a couple of events coming up, um, embedding equity in U.S. global health financing and diplomacy and engaging with law and politics in a post-war world. I think it's really critical, even if these are, especially if these aren't your areas of expertise and interest, that we educate ourselves uh, because this is going to be an interdisciplinary effort involving um, activists, legislators, patients, physicians, um, you know, healthcare providers of all stripes uh, to come together and uh, and take care of women across women and families across the country. So again, thank you so much, and I look forward to seeing you at future events. <laughs>